So today we're going to talk about evolution, intraspecific competition, and interspecific competition. And we'll first talk about the competitive exclusion principle. Then we'll look at intraspecific competition, which is competition within the same species for resources. Then we'll look at interspecific competition, competition between different species for the same resources. Then we'll look at the Lotka-Volterra equation. And finally, we'll discuss null clines. So in the early 1930s, uh, Georgi Gauss from the Soviet Union conducted careful microbial growth experiments as part of his PhD in which he measured populations over time. And he observed the effect of two species on each other. And he stated that two species or two variations within species which compete for their exactly the same requirements cannot occupy the same ecological niche. One will be slightly uh, more efficient and eliminate the other species. He also made another interesting uh, statement regarding evolution or natural selection. If two species coexist in the same ecological niche, the species with the greater capacity or environmental adaption will tend to prevail and to eliminate the other. So Gauss uh, was a Soviet person, and in general, those person people were um, atheists, and they were interested in proving evolution. And so he was interested in quantifying uh, natural selection with experiments in mathematics. And he conducted his work at the same time that Fisher, Haldane, and others developed the field of population genetics. Prior to that, uh, people questioned the mathematical possibility of Darwinian natural selection. But um, these people, uh, mathematicians, um, they combined mathematics with genetics and they proved that evolution by natural selection with math was math mathematically possible through mutation and recombination. So mutation includes changes in individual nucleotides, you know, along the gene and recombination resorts those variants, you know, into a more competitive species. And so, um, so that was back in the 30s, but this graph shows an experiment where they show where mutations uh, and recombinations took place for wild barley. So they sampled the genes in three regions, what they call, this is wild barley, the Western region, the Zagros region, and the Eastern region. And so coalescence events, and coalescence was developed in the 1980s, long after Fisher and Haldane. But um, coalescence events are shown with the open circles. And they are events where two lineages like uh, recombined and formed a last common ancestor. So it's points between last common ancestors uh, within haplotypes. And so those are the open circles. And recombination events are shown with the red circles, the large red circles. And these are events where the nucleotides um, might be rearranged as they recombine with other um, haplotypes. And haplotypes are actually the ones they sample. So a haplotype would be a species with a certain uh, arrangement of the nucleotides. So, in this case, they have the haplotype in the Western region, the haplotype in the Zagros region, and the haplotype in the Eastern region. And so they can, they can trace back, obviously, if they look at genes in present organisms, you know, back to where they divided and where there was recombination and so on. So in this way, they've continued to prove the validity of natural selection. Okay, so back to Gauss. Um, so he conducted experiments with ciliates, and I've talked a little bit about these before in terms of algae. So you can see that they're scooping in algae 
Um, and what they do is they scoop it in as fast as possible so that they can get all the algae to eat and the other ciliates can't. So that's the competition is to scoop in the algae as quickly as possible. Um, so what Gauss did is he conducted um, experiments with two species of ciliates and he compared their growth and populations actually, their growth and population over time. And so one of his findings was that the populations of both were less than they would be in a monoculture, obviously, because they're taking each one is taking up some of the um, the food source. But another interesting thing he found was the combined populations were gre greater than the populations of either. So they had some kind of, um, I don't know what you call it, complementary effect where they the combined populations would be uh, greater. So this is one of his papers. He wrote his uh, dissertation from 1930 to 1934. Um, he was very interested in the logistic model, which had recently been developed. And his supervisor, Alpatov, had, had worked with some of the logistic model people in America. He was in Russia at University of Mo or Moscow University. Okay, and so he wrote this book in 1934 as a result of his PhD work, uh, The Struggle for Existence was a term that referred to natural selection and evolution. And he summarized his experiments and discussed several of the mathematical equations we use in this class, which I thought was very interesting, like exponential growth. And he showed the logistic model, and then he showed the lotka Volterra equation that we're gonna use in this lecture for inter intraspecific and interspecific competition where you have two species uh, competing for resources. So this is intraspecific competition. Um, so that would, for example, that would be algae of the same species uh, competing for the same nutrients. And let's say one had a mutation that enabled it to acquire nutrients specific more quickly. Remember I, I said that they store the nutrients in their vacuoles. Um, and so they, they scoop it up as quickly as possible. The water is depleted of algae or of nutrients and the algae continue to grow because they have it all inside of them. But anyway, um, the result of interest specific competition is that those, um, having a positive mutation and possibly recombination, I guess, I don't understand it that well have a competitive advantage over other organisms of the same species and will eventually proliferate throughout the population. For example, this is two wildebeests and they're probably competing for females, I suppose. So the one that's able to win in this fight would be the one to propagate the genes. And so if one had a positive mutation, was able to win the fights, then they would um, be selected in future populations. There's also interspecies competition, which takes place when two species compete for the same resources, such as a lion and a hyena competing for the same wildebeests and other grazing animals. And I don't know if you've watched uh, videos of lions and hyenas, but they hate each other. Like they kill each other's young, they attack each other. Um, the Hyenas, um, they seem to be able to attack a female lion, but not a male lion. And, you know, they both have the same um, resources. You know, they kill animals, they scavenge. And so um, anyway, what's interesting is that they both survive. You know, they're obviously still there in the same regions. And... So that's one of the outcomes of interspecific or intraspecific competition is that they both survive. And it's important to realize there's um, two, and there's probably more types of interspecific competition or intraspecific competition. One is exploitive competition. For example, aphids competing for the same resources, they um, acquire plant sap with their piercing, sucking mouth parts. And so there'd be several uh, factors contributing to um, an aphid having an advantage over other aphids, such as um, configuration of the mouth, 
the ability to fly, resisting pesticides, reproduction. Uh, some of them kill the larvae of predators by secreting toxic chemicals um, that cause re uh, reactions in the predators. And the other is a parent um, competition such as um, this rabbit, the desert cottontail, where um, two species of rabbits avoid coyotes and other desert predators. And advantages might include speed, alertness, reproductive rate, and camouflage. So this is the um, logistic equation that we all know and love uh, for one species. So we've been working with that, where you have a carrying capacity K, you have a, um, a growth rate um, R, and then you have the species population N. Now this is the, lo the um, logistic equation for interspecific competition where you have two species, um, N1 and N2. And um, so this equation actually is in Gauss's paper too, back in 1934, except it has negative signs. So alpha one two is the inhibitory effect of one species two individual. So here's alpha one two in the change in N1 over time uh, governing equation. So we have change in N1 over DT. It's the same as the individual logistic equation over here, because we have the carrying capacity for population one, we have the growth rate for population one. So that's the same, but there's an inhibitory effect due to N2. Um, and it's not the inhibitory effect of the whole population being there. It's the inhibitory effect, as they say, of one species to individual on the growth of N1. So there's some kind of effect of, a, of an N2 on N1. And so that's called alpha 1, 2. The um, inhibitory effect of one species to individual on the species one population. And then here's alpha 2, 1. So this is the population uh, growth governing equation for species two. And alpha two one is the effect of one species one individual on the species two population. So if there's not an inhibitory effect of one species on the other, then each species grows according to its growth rate coefficient and carrying capacity, even though the other might be there. And so one of the inhibitory factors might be that the species two is acquiring the same resources. So for that reason, the population of species two matters. Okay, so I found this in Gauss's uh, 1934 book. This was an experiment that reflected the impact of the two species on each other in the logistic model. And I, I don't think I said previously, but the previous experiment was ciliates consuming yeast. So he put two species of ciliates and yeast in a, a combined culture, which called a polyculture. And he saw the effect of the two ciliates competing against each other. This experiment has just yeast. So Saccharom Saccharomyces is a yeast, and then there's another yeast in the population, and they're competing for nutrients. And so, so we, he made this graph where he showed the population of Saccharomyces in the culture if it was there all by itself. And I think that he replenished the nutrients in the culture um, like every day, but I, or every hour or something, but I'm not sure. But anyway, um, this is the final population of Saccharomyces, if it's by itself in the culture. And then this is the final uh, population of Saccharomyces if it's in a mixed population. And notice he had a plus alpha N2 and plus alpha N1. And in his paper, he mentioned that they had a complementary effect on each other because the combined population might be greater than the population of each one individually. Um, so for this in-class exercise, I would like you to find the competition coefficients for the two species. 
So that's the alpha one and alpha two. He doesn't show them as different here. He just shows them as an alpha. So really, I want you to go back to this equation where you have two different alphas, two different Ks and so on. Okay. Uh, so we have two equations, so we can only have two unknowns. So I have to give you a lot of the information. Um, so let's assume that the combined population is 15. Notice the population here, the combined population is 13. Okay. So we're just going to assume the combined population is 15, which is above the graph. And the growth coefficients and K values are the same for the two species, okay? So the K values for both are gonna be 13 because that's growing individually. And the growth rate coefficient, we're gonna assume that they're the same, but you can find that by this growth rate curve. So what you'll do is you'll use regression and this data to try to estimate the growth rate coefficient. And we're gonna assume the final concentration of species one is nine. And if the combined population is 15, then that would mean the final uh, population of species two would be what? If this is nine and the total is 15, be six. So you know, uh, the final concentration of species two in the mixed polyculture that we have here. And I'm just making this, this part up because all he, he showed was this graph. Okay, so, um, so what we have is two equations and two unknowns, alpha one, two and alpha two, one. So I'd like you to find those. And I actually haven't done this yet. So I'll be working alongside you to find them myself. So I'll just stop the video and we can start working on that. Okay, so um, hopefully you got it, but I think I'll probably post the solution uh, somewhere. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, now we're gonna talk about isoclines or null clines. And with one species, uh, the maximum population K is one value. So with two species, K varies with the population of the other species. And the maximum population line is called an isocline, which is also called a null cline. Okay, so this is the null cline graph for N1. So N1 is on the x-axis and N2 is on the y-axis. And at the null cline, there's no change in N1. So you can see that this is the N1 population. So instead of a, a stable equilibrium point, now we have a, sta a stable equilibrium line. And you can see that the population of N1 decreases when it's above the line or to the right of the line, and it increases when it's to the left of the line. And then at the null cline, there's no change in the population of N1. So, So the way that we find the null cline is we know that the change is zero. So we can set the um, dn1 over dt value equal to zero. And one option to get dn1 over dt equals zero is that the population of n1 is zero, but that's sort of the trivial result. So the other way is to set the population in the print the value in the parentheses equal to zero. So that's what we're gonna do. K1 minus N1 minus alpha one, two over N2. And the null cline intersects N2 at K1 alpha one, two when N1 is um, zero. So N1 is zero here. And if we set N1 equal to zero in the equation, then we have N2 equals K1 over alpha 1, 2. So that's that, okay? So we have this term on the inside of the parentheses and we, we set N2 equal, or N1 equal to zero. And we can see that the null cline intersects the N2 axis at 
um, K1 over alpha 1, 2. Likewise, we can set N2 equal to zero, and we can see that N1 equals K1. So the null line intersects the N1 axis where N2 is zero at K1. So this is the null line for N2. So we have a, a null line for N1 and an, a null line for N2. And here again, we can we know that the null line is the point where there's no increase or decrease in N2. So we can set that equal to zero. And then what we would want to do is um, solve for this number in the parentheses equal to zero. And then we'd set N2 equal to zero and find the place where the axis crosses N1 or the null line crosses N1 and then set N1 equal to zero and find the point where the null line crosses N2. So what I'd like you to do is um, solve that on your own. And then when you've done that, um, start the video again. Okay, welcome back. Okay, so here we have the null line for species one and the, the null line for species two. And this is the combined null line graph. And in this graph, you can see that if both populations are higher than both null clines, then both species decrease. If both species are lower than both null clines, then both species increase. And there's four possible outcomes for the two species, depending on the relative values of um, K1, K2, alpha 1, 2, and alpha 2, 1. In this case, the species 1 null cline is greater than the species 2 null cline at all points. And this is because K1 over alpha 1, 2 is greater than K2, and K2 over alpha 2, 1 is less than K1. And so this is referred to, I'm sorry. This is referred to as case one. There's four possible cases, obviously, depending on how we rearrange these K1s and K2s. And in this case, species one always wins and the population of species two is driven to zero. And the reason for this is that species one always increases in the region between the null clines and species two always decreases in the region between the null clines. So population of N2 gets driven to zero and population of N1 gets driven higher up to K1. And so this is like natural selection. If you have this case, uh, the, the variant or the species of uh, population one or species one would be dominant and would uh, eventually eliminate N2. So now what I'd like you to do is I draw, I'd like you to draw the case two null cline graph. And in this case, K1 over alpha one, two is less than K, K2 and K1 is less than K2 over alpha two, one. And you can copy the previous graph and adapt it. And what you'll see, just imagine that this is the N2 null cline, or this is the N1 null cline, this is the N2 null cline. You, you'll see that the population of N1 gets driven to zero and N2 uh, goes up to the K1 value. Okay. Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, or the K2 value. And so what you'll do is you can copy this graph and just reverse these, you know, so that the um, N2 null cline is above the N1 null cline. Okay, go ahead and do that. Okay, so um, welcome back. All right, so this is case three. And in this case, the, um, the K1 value is greater than K2 over alpha two one, 
and the K2 value is greater than K1 over alpha 1, 2. And so what you can see is that um, this is called an unstable equilibrium where either population could increase and wipe out the others, okay? So I uh, don't know why um, we don't know all the specifics, but the population of N1 could become very high and N2 very low, or it could cycle, but it's not a stable equilibrium. Okay, and then what I'm gonna ask you to do for the last uh, exercise, and these are also your homework problems, is draw the case for null Klein graph. And in this case, neither species can win and there's a stable equilibrium. So if we go back here, if we reversed um, the species two and species one null Klein, we would see that the population of N2 gets driven to this stable equilibrium point, and the population of N1 also gets driven to this stable equilibrium point. So um, when we think about lions and hyenas, which null Klein do you think applies to them? Which case? Case case um, three, which is unstable, or case four, where they're both driven to a stable population? Four, yeah. So um, they both exist. They both continue to exist somehow between killing each other's babies and stealing each other's food. They both have a stable life. And killing each other, they are both mutually compatible. Okay, uh, we'll see you next time.